A deadly accident in Minneapolis kills a 38-year-old woman. She was walking on the street when a van hit her at 14th Avenue in Franklin. Police are not investigating any foul play, but they do think the sun may have been a factor. In Delaware, 30 kids hurt when their school bus flips over. The cause of the crash under investigation, about 47 students were on board. None of their injuries are life-threatening. Here's a story for you coming from Spain that will likely leave you shocked. A 10-year-old girl gives birth to a baby. The father, a 13-year-old boy. And the girl's mother, very excited, says there's no problem. The police are investigating whether the 10-year-old can stay with her mom. Hmm. That's uh, more than strange. Yeah. It was a very long night, as you well know. Uh, if you stuck around with us to try to get the results of that governor's race. Uh, <laughs> an early morning, too, right well, here. A lot of people walking around in the fog. But we still don't know who the next governor is going to be. Next, we've got live team coverage on Unicide 2010. Will there be a recount? What are the candidates saying? Plus, Marnie Hughes is going to join us with all the latest on the national races. Stick around. No surprise? Uh, no surprise. Disappointed, but no surprise. Still waiting. Voters waking up this morning, still unsure about who the next governor will be and wondering if we're going to be going through another recount. Won't that be fun? Uh, looking at the latest numbers, with 100% of precincts reporting now, Mark Dayton is up by about 8,900 votes. And as you know, that is enough for a recount. They won't actually decide if there's an actual recount, though, until November 23rd when those final results come in. Yeah, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie says either way, he's hoping people can keep emotions out of it. So I'm hoping that in this time, we, we hear how the voters acted yesterday, calmly, with courtesy, with respect, and that that's how we approach recounts because we're Minnesotans. Half a percent. Governor Pawlenty will remain in office until a new governor is sworn in following state law. It's just a waiting game, really, right now for Tom Emmer and Mark Dayton. And, of course, we do have team coverage of how they are responding to these results, or lack thereof. I uh, <laughs> want to start with Fox 9's Tom Lydon and the very latest on Tom Emmer. Hi there, Tom. Hey, well, Tom Emmer was consp conspicuously quiet today. We actually haven't heard from him since late last night. It might have been early this morning. He appears ready to let the party take the lead on this. And today the Republican Party is calling this part part two of the election. And they seem intent on letting it drag on just about as long as it takes. Party chair Tony Sutton really came out firing today. Uh, saying Republicans won't get rolled again. His words, a reference to the Coleman Franken recount, which they believe they should have won. He pointed out the Hennepin County double counting of ballots, which resulted in a 60,000 vote swing towards Emmer last night. He also made some pointed attacks on Secretary of State Mark Ritchie, saying he doesn't know whether the secretary is guilty of fraud or just incompetence. Take a listen. Something doesn't smell right when you take control of the state house. You take control of the state senate. We win in the 8th congressional district, folks. And yet somehow, somehow, we don't win the governor's race. Something doesn't smell right. Democrats have an answer for that. They say up north in the uh, 8th congressional district, there may have been people who voted for Congressman-elect Chip Kravak that actually voted for Mark Dayton instead. So they believe, especially up in the Iron Range, people split that ticket. So they believe that that's not only possible, but probable. Uh, Tony Sutton, the Republican Party chair, said they won't get out lawyered this time. They believe that might have happened during the Coleman Franken recount. On that point, they are already flying in some top election law specialists from D.C. I can tell you their position on this is a real contrast to Mark Dayton. I, you'll hear from him in a moment, but I listened to his press conference, and Mark Dayton talked about how, well, they're reaching out to some lawyers. They're going to see how the system plays out. They're going to let the canvassing board do its job. Uh, much different tact for Republicans. They're promising to be aggressive on this. They believe that was their problem last time. We'll have to see. Back to you. Tom, not just in District 1, but also or District 8, but down in District 1, where Tim Walls, the Democrat, won. He beat uh, Randy Demmer. But also in that district, Walls got the uh, endorsement from Arnie Carlson, and that's the person right. who also endorsed Tom Horner. So maybe some of those independents went away in District 1 as well. 
Yeah, I can tell you, Democrats really believe there, there may have been some very interesting and odd split tickets for a, a number of different reasons. That, well, and that's the Republicans' argument. They see this bump for Republicans, and they wonder why didn't Tom Emmer get that bump? And uh, Democrats believe that that's just the way the tickets played out. They believe it was a little bit unusual in the governor's race to top the ticket. All right, thanks, Tom. Well, Mark Dayton spoke this afternoon, and we want to get the latest on his game plan. Fox 9's Jeff Goldberg live at the state capitol with that. Jeff? Well, uh, Jeff, in many ways, it doesn't seem like Mark Dayton has a huge game plan. As Tom was just mentioning a few moments ago, Dayton saying today that he, of course, has spoken with attorneys about where this thing is going to go next, but he strongly believes this should be handled by local and state election officials and believes that in no way should this become a big legal or political battle. Dayton holding a press conference here at the Capitol this afternoon, and he says he's not declaring himself the winner, and despite the fact he sees no examples where a vote total this large has been ever reversed after a recount, he supports the process moving forward. He says he thinks the people of Minnesota have a right to know that this vote was accurate and correct, but once that is done by county and state officials, he says, it's time to move on. To take it into the political realm and some of the comments that have already been made that are, are very much political in their, in their uh, nature, I think is, is especially at this stage, uh, highly irresponsible. Uh, Dayton uh, did not Dayton, uh, excuse me, did not mention uh, party chair Tony Sutton by name. That was certainly the, the implication there in that statement. He was asked about the possibility of the recount dragging on and Governor Pawlenty staying in office past January 3rd, working with a Republican-controlled legislature. Dayton says he hopes this is all settled by next month and that the winner, presumably him, is sworn into office on January 3rd. Dayton says he has not spoken today with Governor Pawlenty or Tom Emmer. He did, though, say he left voice messages for the presumed, uh, presumptive leaders of the Minnesota Senate and House, the new Republican leadership in those offices. Dayton says he also spoke with Al Franken today, no stranger, of course, to recounts. Franken said, uh, of course, to hang in there, let the legal process and let the, uh, the, the official process play out. And finally, uh, Governor, uh, excuse me, Senator Dayton did get a call right before 5 o'clock uh, Central Time from President Obama. The president wishing uh, Mark Dayton congratulations on this uh, presumptive victory, but of course it is not yet an official victory. We're going to have to see where it goes from here. Live at the Capitol, Jeff Goldberg, Fox 9 News. Interesting, a phone call from the president. Mm -hmm. um, quickly, before we get too much further, I just want to do a quick apology to David Schultz, our guest that we had earlier on today. I'm still trying to learn everybody's name and the confusion of this all, and referred to him as Larry, another analyst. That, uh, that we've had on. Well, that's what show. happens when we have so many experts helping us out. Yeah, that's need, right. Lots need, of analysis for sure. We need our own roster or ballot or something to keep track yeah. sometimes. <laughs> well, for many, waking up without knowing who the new governor will be is more than frustrating. Yeah, especially since there was just a recount in the last election, which everybody remembers. <laughs> Fox 9's Rob Olson talked to some fired up people. He's here now with more on the voice of the voters. Yeah, people are very frustrated. You're frustrated, annoyed, confused even by uh, what's going on, you know, because it is really tough to fathom at a time when we watch movies on demand, we get real-time Twitter updates, that reporting election results can take well into the next day. In fact, we found people falling asleep at the DFL party last night. In fact, this morning, about 1 o'clock this morning, a lot of folks at home, yet again in Minnesota, simply going to bed without knowing the outcome of the governor's race. What is to blame? Well, it's polling technology. In the metro area, electronic ballot readers do get results in pretty quickly. Outstate, though, the technology is older, it is slower, in some cases it is non-existent, but a lot of voters simply don't know that. It does surprise me, actually. Makes you wonder a little bit. Well, I think they need to work on uh, doing the ballots a little better. We have to remember that there are people who live 50 and 60 miles. There are precincts from the polling place. You have to remember that, that some of people are counting ballots that are on paper. They're not even using electronic equipment. So all of that takes time. And when a candidate wins by a wider margin, such as the Bachman-Clark race, well, that race is often over before all those outstate votes have trickled in the coming hours. You don't notice how long it takes with these tight races that we've been having the last decade. Then you do. Rob Olson, Fox 9 News. All right, thanks a lot, Robin. Joining us right now to talk more about the Senate recount that happened just a couple of years ago. We said last night it's like deja vu all over again for a, a lot of people here. Author Jay Weiner from MinPost.com. He wrote a book about the Senate recount called This Is Not Florida, How Al Franken Won the Minnesota Senate Recount. Jay, thanks for joining us. 
uh, live from Hamlin University. Let's talk real quick about uh, the recount then and the possible recount now. What are the differences here? Well, there are a bunch of differences. One is the gap. You know, uh, when Senator Coleman was ahead after the first night of the election in 2008, uh, it shook out to about 215 votes. And right now, it looks like uh, Senator Dayton's up by 8,900. So that's, that's a big one. Secondly, uh, the rules have changed uh, around absentee ballots. And so absentee ballots in 2008 were really an important and controversial issue. I think we'll see them being less controversial, although I'm not certain about that based on how aggressive the Republicans seem to be this time around. Those absentee ballots were also counted centrally this time in each county rather than at the precincts where, where uh, the absentee people w would vote. I think what you'll also see this time, Jeff, and we heard it today, is the difference is that the Republicans are behind this time, and in 2008 they were ahead. And so um, y your strategy changes. In 2008, Senator Coleman wanted to shut down the, uh, the, the recount, and now they really want to keep it going. Mm -hmm. and Conversely, the DFL um, now is trying to say, let's, let's let the process proceed. And in 2008, uh, Al Franken was the one who wanted to look for votes under every rock. So their positions have changed. This is a wide margin we're talking about here. We heard Mark Dayton say earlier today that nobody's overcome this wide a margin in any kind of a recount. What is the largest number? Would you uh, know off the top of your head since you've, uh, you've done your research on this that anybody is overcoming a recount? I, I don't, but here's what I do know is that nationally over the last 25 years, there have been just a handful of statewide recounts that have flipped, and I mean a handful, probably five or six from Indiana uh, to Louisiana uh, to Washington State to, to Minnesota, and those margins have been in the hundreds and not in the you know, eight, 9,000 range. Now, these tallies do change over time, and you'll see as the counties begin to go over their vote tally, there will be some changes that happens in every election. Mm -hmm. Whether it stays at 8,000 or goes up to 10,000 or comes down to 7,000, I'm not sure, but I don't know the answer to that question. And what about uh, the uh, former Secretary of State, Joan Groh, who served this state for a long, long time and knows the ins and outs of elections, talking about how it just can't be sped up because there are people who live 50 and 60 miles from their polling places. You know, we're not the only state that has people who live that far away. They don't seem to have these issues in other states. Well, um, in a lot of states now, of course, all the balloting is, is, is by mail, including in Washington state, and that election won't be known for weeks right now. Patty mm -hmm. Murray is, is in a, a, a recount. So uh, are you, what are you suggesting? I'm not really quite sure what Well, what I'm just asking. saying it just seems like, uh, you know, here we go again in Minnesota, another recount, how long is it going to take? And uh, as you heard in Rob Olson's piece there, a lot of people are frustrated. Well, I understand that people are frustrated, but, you know, the democratic process moves pretty slowly. I, I'm one who argues that the 35 weeks that it took for Al Franken to become senator wasn't a bad thing for the process. I know it was frustrating, and people got mad, and the Democrats wanted Franken to be seated, and they wanted him to vote um, in D.C. on important issues. But I think the, a process that is clear and transparent does take time, and it gives people faith in, in the system. Now, if people want to game the system, if the Republicans or the Democrats want to extend it when they shouldn't, that's, you know, that, that's one of thing but well, I'm not that troubled as a reporter by the fact that things go a little slowly now the important thing is that we get it all right thanks Jay Wiener we Correct. appreciate you being you out with us thanks. well Minnesotans wait to find out who their next governor will be a Republican will be taking charge in Wisconsin Milwaukee County Executive Scott Walker defeating Democratic Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett yesterday to become that state's next governor winning 54 percent of the vote Walker basing his campaign on cutting taxes Barrett says he has no regrets he plans to run for re-election as Milwaukee's mayor. And with the shift in power, a lot of uh, national elections could also impact us here. That is true. Marnie's tracking those results as she was all night long last night and joins us with more. Good morning, Marnie. Hi there, you guys. Well, now that, yeah, we all forget. Have we, has anybody slept? <laughs> Not much. Not really. <laughs> now that some of that dust has settled, we're getting a better picture of the national landscape. Both chambers of Congress changed a lot last night. Republicans taking control of the House also narrowing the gap in the Senate. This means the two sides are going to be forced to work together, but you can expect some of the same battles that we've had in the past. First, taxes. you got House Speaker-designate John Boehner calling for an extension of the Bush-era tax cuts, and President Obama saying that the cuts should go only to the middle class. The other big fight, health care. Listen, I believe that uh, the health care bill that was enacted by uh, the current Congress will kill jobs in America uh, ruin the best health care system in the world, and bankrupt our country. Uh, that means that we have to do everything we can 
uh, to try to repeal this bill and replace it with common sense reforms that will bring down the cost of health insurance. My goal is to sit down with uh, Speaker-elect Boehner and Mitch McConnell and Harry and Nancy sometime uh, in the next few weeks and see where we can move forward uh, in a way that, uh, first of all, does no harm, uh, that extends those tax cuts that are very important for middle class families uh, in a way that... President Obama going on to say that he's reflecting on policies and says he needs to do a better job in Washington, as do everyone else in Washington. He also says he doesn't regret some economic decisions, including the bailout of banks and the automakers. Also big in this midterm, Republicans picking up 10 gubernatorial seats, including Wisconsin, as you mentioned just a moment ago. This was the best showing by the GOP in the midterm since World War II. So now it's how they get things done in Washington uh, together. Marnie Hughes, Fox 9 News. What? Together? Huh? Washington? Will the warm weather stick around for the weekend? That's what we really want to know. Ian's got it all covered for us. We'll talk with him in a moment. Also, in sports, he is no longer a Viking, but he is back in the NFL. Where will Randy Moss play this weekend? Jim Rich has all the answers next on Fox at 5. Well, more fallout from the Randy Moss loss. I can hardly even say it. <laughs> it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. And a Timberwolves player has a few bruises today. Jim's here with that. Absolutely. Vikings coach Brad Childress, he refused to explain why he threw Randy Moss off the team today when he was grilled by the media. He remained committed to keeping his reasons private. So we turned to the locker room to see how Randy's former teammates felt. Most said they were stunned by the news on Monday. And, all the, and although they didn't really want to admit it, they never really got an answer either. The explanation, we really um, didn't really get one. Um, but like I said, we wasn't, I'm just not trying to feed into it too much. Um, it is what it is. Um, this team has to move on. Um, this offense has to move on. Um, so we'll, we'll just take it as that. No offense to the fans, but they don't always see the, the big picture of what goes on. Um, you know, inside the walls of this facility, and you know, Randy's a good player. We can never take anything from that. He's a, a dominant receiver, but uh, you know, we need 53 team players, and that's what coach emphasized. So that's what we have now, and that's what we're going to roll forward with. The Gopher hockey team finally on a bit of a roll after sweeping Colorado College last weekend have won three straight, but the good times haven't lasted long. Sophomore Zach Budish, injured in a moped accident on Monday, may miss significant time. The giant forward from Edina has been off to a great start, but may be facing surgery on his injured knee. I have a good idea of what the case is right now, and I'm just kind of, like I said, playing it day by day and, um, you know, just trying to keep a positive attitude. Um, you know, I've been a little more upbeat today than I was yesterday, uh, hanging out with teammates. It's, you know, it's good to be back. I was at my house the last couple nights. And the Wolves, Michael Beasley, a great start against his old team Miami last night until he took this hard fall in the first half. Beasley left the game with a bruised left hip. It's painful to watch. X-rays, though, were negative. He will not play tonight when the Wolves face Orlando. Guys? Anybody in pain like that, Jimmy? All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Hopefully you'll be okay. Yeah, we'll be back in just a moment. All right, Ian's here now. Check on weather. Mm, hang on to your hats and small furry animals and grab a warm coat while you're at it. Blustery tomorrow with a strong wind out of the northwest. I have a high of 43, but dress for a wind chill high in the mid-30s and we'll stay cool and windy through Friday. But look at the weekend as we fall back with our clocks. Yay. Plenty of sunshine and we warm into to near 60 early next week. Mm. Fantastic. It's There's the golf and weather. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, everybody. We'll be back here at 9 and at 10. Seinfeld is coming up next.